Welcome to Philosophy of Value Workshops number 33 of series 7. The question for today is what is the viability of the phenomenon of value as a principle of life? Uh, reading from one of my works, uh, The Pursuit of Value, Chapter 2, Section 1. Now, in these workshops, I've been presenting the details of a particular value theory of human existence. And that theory is led by a principle of affirmation or will to value leading to a sufficiency of value. But there is a crucial question underlying this project. That is, is the phenomenon of value even a viable concept for such a principle? In these workshops, we have discussed many related <coughs> issues around such a principle of value, such as what is value and what are the criteria for determining such a principle of value. We will <coughs> review some of these questions shortly. But one crucial question here is about the status of value. Here, we can note at least two ways of understanding value. One is as an abstract concept that might be used to explain a philosophical system. Another is as a phenomenal or felt experience. In my view, a resolution of human existence must account for both of these meanings. But does value really exist as an actual experience or a mental state? Or is it only an abstract property or a collective noun? We might accept the existence of value states like liking and desiring, or even of ma magnanimity and moral fortitude. Now, value states are mental states in which value is a necessary condition of their existence <coughs> as above. And we might accept that value is the common feature or property of such value states. But can value be sufficiently <clears throat> isolated as value to serve as a principle of life? To illustrate the problem, we can compare value with the famous words of President <clears throat> Roosevelt. That these were, we have nothing to fear except fear itself. Now fear is a real and tangible mental state, but is or can value be an actual mental state? Or can value only be a predicate or a collective noun or a social construct? We might, we might later want to take this comparison further and ask, we have nothing to ultimately value except value itself. But this is a far-reaching claim that preempts the question above to be discussed in due course. Further to this issue, it is also sometimes claimed that, like consciousness, value doesn't really exist. That is, value <coughs> predicates exist as qualifiers, but value doesn't exist as a mental state. For example, Value only consists in values like wanting, loving, hating, or beauty, truth, and knowledge. But these are value states which do constitute a valid concept of value. And it's also said that there is no pure consciousness, but only conscious states like cognition, affect, and volition. I agree. And even personal identity is just an aspect of consciousness, not a supposed <coughs> essence. But consciousness is bound together with its constituents of cognition, affect, will and value. And it is centred with a personal identity in a synthetic unity through space and time. And value is a common element of experience in all instances of value states. Yet there is no such thing as pure consciousness, pure value, 
or even pure cognition. But that's no reason not to use the general or collective concept of value or the idea of value states. <coughs> and we can just as well talk about co cognitive states or affect states in a similar way. Also, on the question of the viability of value as a principle of life, we need to briefly mention the alternatives. I previously discussed these in the analytic context of cognitive and non-cognitive mental states. I found this classification <coughs> inadequate and added affect, will and value to cognition. I also previously discussed co consciousness itself as a possible human objective. But I argued that c cognition, affect, will and consciousness weren't adequate objectives. So I won't be going over these arguments again. The question of objectivity or subjectivity is also relevant to the status and viability of value. And the question of objectivity and subjectivity also bears upon the problem of apprehending value. I previously argued for both subjectivity and value and that there's a fundamental problem of its apprehension. Yet some philosophers like Iris Murdoch, Nozick and Derek Parfit do believe in objective values. Parfit replies to criticisms of objective values by explaining that they are not strange entities. These are the supposedly strange or queer <coughs> entities posed by Mackey or by W. V. Quine's ontology. Parfit replies that things like sh shortages don't commit one to strange entities. But we understand that shortages aren't the same kind of things as objective values. Yet Parfit's example of shortages as an abstract yet real condition reveals an interesting kind of status. It raises questions about re realities that consist of structures that include absences to be noted shortly. I'm interested in both structures and absences as devices for explaining consciousness and value. Yet more relevantly here, it argues against the status of value as such a strange entity. I myself argue for the subjectivity of value as well as both normative values and an error theory of value. Yet my concern today is instead with the viability of value as a principle of life, ethics or meaning. And in this respect, I can talk about the status of value in its context as a state of consciousness. That is, as implied earlier, problems of human existence can only be properly posed in terms of consciousness and value. That is, consciousness is the correct realm of examination, though not an adequate objective in itself and that such objectives should be resolved in and through the pursuit of certain value states. As above, these are the wheels of value, the affirmation of value, and the value of value leading to a sufficiency of value. I previously explained and argued this view, and I won't be doing so again <coughs> today. Yet the significance of consciousness and value as features of humanity, also argues against another kind of misapprehension. That is, a principle of life can be obtained from a physical or scientific pr principle. These are principles like ca causality, quantum theory or singularity. Such aren't credible candidates as principles of human life or existence. But other kinds of human principles might be able to compete as viable principles of human existence. These are principles like <coughs> evolution, the Hegelian dialectic, or Burke's iron law of history. Such may be co comprehensive or 
inescapable in their own fields of application, but they aren't sufficient as principles of human life. This is because they don't explain what is essentially human about life, and this m misapprehension is quite often overlooked. The kind of principle we are lo looking for must be more than a social, biological or cosmological algorithm. It must provide explanation and direction in terms of human experience to consciousness, value and purpose. And the meaning of a principle here is it has an active and not an abstract <coughs> component. The significance of consciousness, however, goes beyond it being a basis for understanding human existence. Consciousness is significant because it has the status of one of the fundamental modes of existence in the world. Consciousness isn't just a contingent <coughs> entity like a particular species of fauna or flora. It is both the essentialia of human existence and the fundamental aspect of the universe. But this isn't an endorsement of either panpsychism or a cosmic consciousness. Neither does this <coughs> distinction commit us to dualism, which hangs on a particular conception of mind. Alternatively, I envisage mind in relation to, rather than dualistically <coughs> independent of the world. Yet the questions, what is consciousness and what is value, are only incidentally re relevant to the viability of value as a principle of life. This is because the character of value is an aspect of the question of the status of value. And more than a theory of value, we need an explanation of value as a human objective. Yet I will ne nevertheless provide a brief <coughs> outline of the character of value. And this speaks to the viability of value as a human objective. I previously began by listing applications of value like ethical, <coughs> economic, aesthetic, religious and scientific values. I then cited differences between attributed, intrinsic, affective, co cognitive, subjective and objective values. Yet even these didn't ad adequately define value, so I gave a phenomenology of value. These, this y yielded features like su subjectivity, su selection, preference, quality and mm, intentionality. A fundamental feature of value is its subjectivity, shown in Mackey's mm, argument that there are no objective values. Objective here means the status of ontologically substantive objects, not normativity or universality. Mackey gives three main arguments to support his view. The psychological errors of reversal, projection and his argument from queerness. Other theorists' of arguments about different kinds of queerness are also re relevant to the viability of the concept of value. Sartre, for example, defines value as a lack or absence in the idea that value can simultaneously be and not be. Ray J Jackendorf describes his account as explaining the peculiar logic of value. Such accounts indicate a certain <coughs> ambivalence of value and real concerns about its de definition. That is, there is a further question about the definition of value. Now this is a different from the question of the character of value. In addition to the applications, modes and features of value, there are also many different states of value. These are different states like desire, love, hate, morality, aesthetics, bias, that are also called values. One question here is, are these different states all masquerading as one concept of value. Some cl clarification can be found with the classification of motivational, affective, 
have perspectival values. Motivational or volitional and moral values are ethical principles and reasons for action. Moral and motivational values are comparable and are universally re recognised as particular kinds of value. Yet these kinds of value have different degrees of volitional content. Experiential or affective values are those like love, hate, desire, guilt, shame, disgust and pity. But affective values aren't often described as such, as such adding to the suspicion of a neglect of value. Perspectival or cognitive values apply to different <coughs> perspectives, value-laden facts and bias. The notion of perspectival values is widely used by philosophers such as Williams and Nagel. Yet this cl classification can include nu numerical values and truth values of the logically true or false. But perspectival values don't even appear to have subjective experiential content that seems essential to value. And numerical values and, num and numerical and truth values only seem to be values <coughs> analogously. They seem to be better described as quantification or quantity, not the quality applicable to value. However, with the exception of numerical and true values, some c commonalities are evident. These are the noted properties like subject, subjectivity, preference and quality. But again, there is no time to explicate these properties here. The scope and application of value in human life bears upon both its definition and its viability as a principle of life. Value or values can be found in every aspect of human life from reason and action to love and hate. Yet for clarification we should name several of the main expressions of value. In religion for example God represents the believer's highest value and beliefs re represent various other values. A meaningful life is also a worthwhile and valuable life. <coughs> Economics can be thought as a quantification of material values in terms of m monetary tokens. David Easton described p politics as the authoritative <coughs> allocation of values. And ethical principles are values that guide moral action. Yet it's an indication of both neglect and need that we have no theory of value as a principle of ethics or of life. In Aristotle's virtue theory, ethics, character has been f formulated as a principle of ethics. In Kantian ethics, reason and duty have been f formulated as principles. And in utilitarianism, happiness has been f formulated as a principle of ethics. But value itself, as the major principle of ethics, is missing from the lexicon of moral philosophy. I hope to have mitigated this deficit with a value theory ethics as a reinterpretation of virtue theory ethics. And I will shortly, sh and I will shortly outline how value can also figure as a principle of life. But before that, another question crucial to the viability of value as a valid principle is its co comprehensiveness. That is, can the concept of value itself adequately answer the questions that it is supposed to answer? That is, not questions of physics or science, but questions of ethics, aesthetics, meaning and purpose. We can also ask here about the involvement and relation of other mental states in value as a valid principle. The four states of cognition, affect, will and value can be thought to exhaustively constitute consciousness. But in practice value as a mental state can never be isolated from cognition 
affect and will. These other states will always be components of value to a greater or lesser extent. Hilary Putnam, for example, argues for such mm, entanglement in his collapse of the value fact dichotomy. The question of co comprehensiveness can also be asked in the context of the standard cognitive non cognitive de debate. That is, can cognitive or non cognitive states explain activities like m motivation, morals, and meaning? Cognition by itself is often thought to lack m motivational power or moral, moral substantiveness. Aff um, affect or value are thought to lack the ability to give the direction or guidance. Again, in practice, both are required to deliver results. But cognition is also a means to an end, and ends, as meaning or purpose, must be conceived in terms of value. Happiness is also often cited as an end, but it is also frequently rejected as such, as I have often argued myself. The will is also sometimes cited as an end, but it is a process or a product rather than an end. The four states of cognition, affect, will and value might then be thought to exhaustively constitute co consciousness. And by a process of elimination, we are left with value as the only viable candidate for a principle of life. Yet at this point, we are faced with the question of the criteria that might render value a valid principle. Again, a previously discussed criteria like consistency, coherence, quality, self-validation and sufficiency. And these aren't directly related to the question of the viability of value as a principle of life. Yet it's useful to outline them again in order to clarify the question. Consistency of value might be strictly defined in terms of its logical consistency of Kant's categorical imperative. An example of inconsistency might be found in contravening Hume's is-ought <coughs> distinction. Similar examples might be found in Moore's naturalistic fallacy and fact-value confusions. But my view of consistency is more subjective as in Sartre's rejection of bad faith and the spirit of seriousness. We can also add the inconsistency of self-defeating, self-negating and negative values. And conversely, the greatest consistency can be found in the will to value and the affirmation of value. This is my position that I present at the moment as explanation rather than argument. Again, for an explanation of value coherence, we can begin with standard accounts in philosophy. Classical and rationalist accounts assume a unity and coherence of values held by religion and thinkers like Kant. More modern thinkers have had different perspective of the idea of coherence within values. G. E. Moore and Robert Nozick, for example, determine intrinsic value by its degree of organic unity. But as Nozick points out, organic unity can also be a property of negative events, like evil plans. I myself think that organic unity could be more simply described as coherence. But this is an objectivist conception of both intrinsic value and organic unity that I wouldn't want to adopt. I believe that a subjectivist conception of value coherence is both more realistic and less problematic. Quality of value is a more intangible feature that, is, that has received more attention from poets than philosophers. Hence, Robert Persick discovers 
the principle of quality in his Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Yet Kant argued for the quality of intention in the goodwill as the primary criteria of morality. For Kant, moral action needs to be free, informed and without constraints or inclination. Yet one of the, main effect, one of the major factors determining quality of value is the nature of its physical or mental object. Different objects like truth, beauty, God or sex objects will produce different qualities of value. Unexpectedly, the quality of the object can also vary with its degree of cognitive involvement. I previously described this as attenuated cognition in explanations of mystery, obfuscation and morals. Yet the quality of value is found in its capacity for ethical, aesthetic and affective content. For it is what John or what John McDowell tried to explain as a cognitive capacity as favourable light. But we can only continue to discuss this central topic in a wider e exposition of value elsewhere. The criterion of self-valuation of value raises the idea of a priori knowledge, but that's not the point here. Self-validating a priori principles exist in logic, ma mathematics and arguably Descartes' I think therefore I am. Yet the will to value is also a self-validating, therefore the alternative is contradictory and self-negating. But it's not the material content of values that's being validated, but the affirmation of value itself. That is, within the realm of value, value must be affirmed in order to value anything within that realm. And we are confined to the realm of value by the requirements of morals, meaning and purpose. As part of a critique of the will to power, Heidegger describes the will to will in a similar <coughs> encompassing way. He writes that the will to will forces the calculation and arrangement of everything for itself. But of course I am advocating a will to value, not a will to will or will to power. And in my view, the will to value as an affirmation or value of value leads to a certain sufficiency of value. I've given examples of value sufficiency as magnanimity, moral fortitude and self-esteem. Yet as indicated by the ambivalence of value, value sufficiency isn't a quantification or maximization of value. This is because it must incorporate elements like absence, alterity, quality and altruism. Value sufficiency is my central pr principle that addresses <coughs> issues of ethics, meaning, purpose and human experience. And as my central pr principle, all my work is directed towards explicating this concept. As well as the above examples, we can also define value sufficiency by contrast to other uses of the word sufficiency. That is, it isn't the, su the sufficiency in the principle of sufficient reason as the possibility of explanations of everything. Neither is it the, the sufficiency of necessary and sufficient conditions. It is a relative sufficiency of value required to resolve the particular problems at hand. For example, relative su sufficiencies like moral fortitude, ma magnanimity and courage. With that brief d definition, we can address questions of scepticism about the viability of a principle of life. To begin with, there is a widespread scepticism about the possibility of any comprehensive principle. 
that is life and indeed consciousness may be too complex and diverse to admit to a comprehensive principle. Such a criticism has been made of Nietzsche's <coughs> affirmations of life as a form of value monism. Isaiah Berlin's pluralism also seems to be a problem for a single comprehensive principle. I answer with the concept of consciousness that affords singularity even though it's subject to radical divisibility. That is, I exist within a specific space and timeline and my, ex and my <coughs> experiences are joined together by my <coughs> identity. Moreover, I exist and consciousness exists and because it exists it must have properties and that these properties are the parameters of human existence that include value. These claims presuppose characteristics and relations between consciousness and value that I have previously argued. I can't argue them all here but I can continue to raise issues about a, comp a comprehensive principle of value and I should re reiterate that I'm not arguing for a principle of value here but explaining its viability. But we have been talking about value as if it is <coughs> isolated from both the world and other mental states. Yet in re reality and in my account value has an intimate relation with supporting cognitive structures. The quality of value largely depends on the quality of the cognitive object towards which it intends. And its sufficiency of value is determined by its degree of independence from such objects. My usual example is of parental support required by a five-year-old that would be <coughs> inappropriate for a 25-year-old. Yet human beings are creatures that recognise their own finitude, inadequacy and lack of value. And the recognition of a genuine absence or lack of value is one of the reasons to pursue further value. In this way, value sufficiency is also a lack of value that calls value to produce further value. Thereby value involves a proclivity to further value as the will to value and it also involves a moderating dialectic with cognitive frameworks. In conclusion I repeat that I'm not making <coughs> arguments here but explaining the viability of a principle of value. In this project we have examined the status of value and the kind of principle that would serve our purposes. To this end we eliminated purely abstract, metaphysical or materialistic or scientific principles. That is, we found that a principle of life has to address human experience. And more specifically, that it must be framed in terms of consciousness and value. The principle or principles I advocate is a will to value or the value of value leading to a sufficiency of value. And one aspect of showing the viability of this principle is explaining the reasons for holding it. One reason is the elimination of principles in terms of cognition, will or affect, leaving only value as a candidate. Another reason is found in the characteristics of value sufficiency as a principle of life. In this respect I noted five features of consistency, coherence, quality, self-validation and sufficiency. Yet this doesn't <coughs> eliminate the possibility of others. And finally to maintain the plausibility as well as the viability of value sufficiency two other points were made. One was about concerns of value monism that I address with diverse applications of a unitary principle. 
that is consciousness is an integrating concept of which value is a constitutive part. Other, the other similar concern was about value as an unrestricted or, un, or an unconstrained force. Here we saw that value and the relative sufficiency of value was in a dialectic with cognitive frameworks. That is, the quality of particular values was largely mm, determined by the quality of their cognitive objects. And that even more significantly, quality of value is related to its independence from supporting cognitive objects. So let me have your comments and criticisms at the meeting or on websites like zoom or meetup.com.